We are here in what they call the robing room at the Church of the Holy Trinity, just after a rehearsal by the Mendelssohn Chorus preparing for Dr. Isai Barnwell's contribution to what they're calling Big Sing American Dream. This concept of how music is a uniting factor between all people and how we can still be respectful of an African centeredness, of an Afrocentric approach to call and response, to learning without sheet music, without particular uh, enunciation habits, just to be a part of a collective that's learning a melody and delivering it together. That is what this performance will be all about. And we will be speaking with Dr. Isa Arwell to talk more about her path to teaching music, to writing music, and what her hopes are for us to continue musical legacy within our community. I'm Stephanie Renee, and this is another edition of Word Backstage. Word Backstage, hosted by Steph Renee. On 900 AM WURD.com. One of the things I was most curious about in getting a chance to observe some of the uh, rehearsal for the big sing is your lifelong relationship to music. Uh, I tell people all the time that I feel music was my first language and then everything else came after it. Uh, how do you describe sort of how you have evolved through your love of music and sharing it with the world? Wow. Well. I, uh, I think it started before I was born. My father was a violinist and taught violin, and he named me after a violinist. So I am Isai after Eugène Isai, who was a Belgian violinist. Um, you can also say Issei, but I've used Isai publicly. Um, and so from the age of two and a half, I studied violin all the way through high school, majored in music in high school, and then decided that I wanted to go into speech pathology. And in college, I did sing um, in the choir and picked up the guitar and wanted to be Odetta's look-alike, sound-alike. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and then after that, I, when I graduated, I went to Howard actually to teach and um, gave up the music. And it wasn't until 76, 77, that um, I went to a Unitarian church in DC. And most of the black folk were sitting in the audience. And there was an upstairs choir that only had two people. It was a great choir. I joined the choir and kept wondering why there weren't more of us. And Mostly it was because you had to read music. They had a rehearsal at 9.30 on Sunday morning, and if you couldn't read, you couldn't be in it. And I said, well, we don't have to have uh, music, you know, written music in order to be a choir. And so I started arranging things and just teaching people the parts. And that's kind of how all of it started. And then Bernice Regan came to church one Sunday when that choir was performing and I was singing and she said, oh, you know, he's having auditions, you want to come? I thought, well, okay. And that was the beginning of another thing, but I never gave up the choir uh, or the concept. I had to give up the choir at some point when it, we started going on the road on Sundays, we sure. were not there, but the concept, um, stayed with me that there were people who wanted to sing and and we could be a choir we could be a congregation we could be whatever and um, Sweet Honey was artists in residence at the Levine School of Music mm -hmm. and then the group decided after several years that we would move on to another kind of activity but I stayed as an artist in residence and every month since then I've been doing a community sing at the Levine School. Nice. And so now people are sort of hearing about it. And I've been going to different communities. But I also do a lengthier workshop where I try to get people to understand the difference between an Afrocentric worldview and a Eurocentric worldview. And if you understand that, then you know that we come out of an oral tradition, and so there is really no need for written down music that we learn and we teach orally. 
And so I've just, you know, really tried to instill that in people so that they understand that there's no good or bad about whether or not you read music. The point is that we come together and we listen to each other in a very intense kind of way and that there very often is call and response so you don't have to know the song before you begin to sing it, you know, mm -hmm. and that these um, traditions of how we sing have taken us through our struggle in this country. And one of the things that makes me a little bit sad is that young people don't have that connection. And so I'm trying really to get people to who have a, a deep kind of um, connection with Black Lives Matter and millennials in general um, to, to come to some workshops and or just, you know, pull yourselves together and let me talk to you for a little bit, you know, okay? <laughs> and let's make some sounds and let's, let's try to understand why it is hip hop is not the best form for rallying people mm. that you want to really sense uh, a coming together in a way that, you know, you can't move us. You can't change us. We are a force to be reckoned with. And the reason hip hop doesn't do that is because it's written for a single voice. Mm. Most hip hop artists now don't even have backup singers. So, <laughs> you know, what, what is the group going to sing? And so um, hip hop is serving its function in documenting who we are and moving our history forward in that way. But I think people, younger people need to understand how powerful it is, you know, when there are 50 of us, when there are 100 or 200 of us and we are all singing, you know, and, and through our songs we're saying who we are, what we will tolerate and what we will not tolerate and what our goals are. And um, so I kind of am hoping that, you know, gradually I'll have a chance to work with more and more young people to get that, that force together, that mm -hmm. vocal force together, so that um, we're not just sort of standing and listening. I've never quite heard it articulated that way, but that brought to my mind of one, as you distinguish between Afrocentric and Eurocentric and the unifying power of the collective voices singing, I wonder, do you make a distinction between sacred and spiritual? I do not. And I don't make a distinction between sacred, non-sacred, because in an African worldview, all of life is sacred. So whatever activity you're engaging in, if it is correct, if it's proper, if it's right, um, it's sacred. You know? So I don't make that distinction. I grew up in D.C. Um, and attended uh, Mount Zion United Methodist Church, which is the oldest black UMC congregation in the city in Georgetown. Um, and it was a struggle because of the religious traditions of the church to get them to embrace gospel. Mm, wow. The classical approach to music, as you've described, you know, the, the, being able to read music, not so much as singing in a particular style that was deemed acceptable. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, because you've worked with these different uh, groups and moved in and out of these spaces, if you feel that... Um, some of those distinctions have separated a younger generation from having some of that close communion with a church congregation or even with a particular faith system. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, every generation creates its own music. And I think what happened when the 20, when we got to the 20th century and we had the beginnings of jazz and we had blues, um, which in its sound seemed to change the way in which we sang together. Um, people, I think, felt that did not belong in the church. It might be okay in terms of our social life, but it was not acceptable. And I think at that point, there were a lot of things that were being broken in our traditions, you know, that we, in fact, had abs absorbed a lot of the value system of people who had controlled our lives and how we lived it. And so that is where I think the definition of sacred and secular 
began to really show itself. Until then, I don't think we had that, mm -hmm. you know, that we understood that every aspect of living and life was sacred, even working against our will was a form of sacred something. And we honored the way we did it. That's how you know. You know, we didn't do our work sloppily, even if we felt we shouldn't be doing it. Right. We did our work well. And so now you get to the 20th century and you have a number of other sounds coming in. It's becoming uh, a way of dividing social from, from sacred. And, um, and I think we've continued to kind of move in that direction. The thing that we don't get, I think, is that if you follow a continuum in our music, what you understand is that yes, the music constantly changes because it has to reflect who we are, where we are in that time, but that doesn't move what's sacred out of it, you know? And that a lot of the influences um, that we brought have really come from where we originally came from. A lot of people don't understand, for example, that a long meter hymn, mm -hmm. ah, 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 you know, okay? That is very similar to the call to prayer mm -hmm. that Muslims do. Mm -hmm. And that same sound is what you hear in blues. We haven't lost that connection. And so when we look more deeply, you know, we see, oh, oh, we just shifted here a little bit. We just, you know. Yeah. And so I think people in churches get really protective of what they will allow. The church, a lot of churches do this. The church I grew up in must have had five choirs, <laughs> you know, because they had the old folk who were just sitting and rock for hours and sing. And then they had the itty bitty children's choir. And then they had the, you know, the anthem choir. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, here come these other folks. You know, with this piano, you uh -huh. know, this rocking organ, and you know, everybody wanted to. You couldn't figure out whether you could dance. Right. You wanted to, because you felt the spirit a little differently. But mm, so they had their own time. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think um, it's all related. It's all on a continuum. Yeah. Yeah. In in that space. Um, as we talk about the universality of music, but still coming from an African worldview, mm -hmm. uh, have you had people uh, ask if they are welcome in a space to be part of this collectivity that you promote with things like uh, like the Big Sing events? Because I've had people say to me that soul to them coming from a Eurocentric perspective might have felt a little alienating and they didn't know if they were welcome. Uh, your songs are deeply entrenched in, in, in African spirituality, but you make them welcome for everyone to come and participate. How do you help to break down any kind of uh, uh, perceived barriers that people might feel about whether they can sing the kind of music that you write. Yeah, generally, um, I don't allow those concerns to be articulated. You know, you showed up, you're going to sing. <laughs> <laughs> you made that move, okay? Right, right. And so, you know, you, you are going to do what we're doing, mm -hmm. period. Yeah. Yeah. You can't sit and observe. That's not how this is done. Gotcha. And you can't write it down. Mm -hmm. Don't write it down because we don't do that. Right. That is not participating, you know. So if you come, you're going to participate. I love it. <laughs> um, and, and is it odd, as someone who has written uh, a lot of the material that we'll be singing and um, and taught it for a smaller ensemble that comes from a, a particular worldview? Is it is it uh, different to be able to sit and listen to, say, a larger ensemble that you haven't directed, um, per se, interpret it, have it written down as they're learning it, uh, and deliver it in that way? You know, it is a little different, but that's okay. You know, there there isn't you can't duplicate the experience of a Sweet Honey in the Rock, okay? Five women. When I auditioned for Sweet Honey, I showed up, the members, the current members showed up, and somebody started singing. And basically, I had to find my part. 
I had to create my way. And how I did that was part of the audition, okay? Mm -hmm. And so in every song they sang, nobody told me what to sing. You know, <laughs> I just sort of found my way. And if it was something that somebody had written, or if it was something that somebody else had sung and they're not there anymore, they might say, well, you know, so-and-so was on the such and such. Okay. You know, but they never sang my part right. or rarely would sing my part, okay, unless it was something very specific that they wanted. So, I think I forgot the question, but... <laughs> But it was about the fact that because you learned them that way right. or, you, or you taught them that way, having a larger ensemble with sheet music. Yes, does, does thank you. Give okay. you a different perspective. So, you know, you, I think you understand at the point that you commit the music to, to sheet music, um, you, are, you are agreeing that there is another way of performing. Gotcha. Um, the choir that is performing the music tomorrow actually is a very fine choir and they've gotten it. They have gotten it. And I'm very pleased. I'm very, very pleased because there is, they, they've got the syncopations, they've got the rhythm, they're listening, and, and they understand what I'm trying to say in the lyric. Mm -hmm. um, we had a little bit of a session where I was talking to them about that. Um, for example, there's one song where there are two generations in the song, and the first part is just very, it's kind of, you know, kind of pulsed. And you can almost see an older person just sitting there rocking and saying, mm hmm, well, okay, all right. And then the younger folks say, oh, but so and so and so and so, you know, and then kind of gets quiet again. The grandmother, you know, okay, well, you know, you go on out and you. You try it for yourself. Okay, well, you know, and w once I really explain that to them, they fully got it. Yeah. You know, so there's a brassier part and there's the more controlled part. Right. And so I think, um, I, th you know, having it written down on the page changes it, particularly if there's no one to explain how you, the subtle differences that you make to bring it back to where it was. Mm -hmm. Is there a way to maybe um, offer, you know, almost like a director's notes in a script to for directors who would like to make sure that they're staying true to the essence of how yeah. you've presented it? Yeah, there are those, but sheet music, you know, really can lock you in. Yeah. And, and, and sometimes you have to get off the sheet music and just feel the pulse. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, okay. Okay, <laughs> two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Mm -hmm. It's that difference, yeah. you know? Absolutely. Is it crisp? Does it melt from one rhythm into another? You know, how distinctly? It, that, that takes a, a little bit more interpretation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as you sang bass for Sweet Honey and the Rock, you gave it a lot of that pulse. You gave it a lot of that character. I think there's a lot of women who might have a solid range, but be very intimidated by the idea of what you were able to do in terms of giving depth and roundness to those low notes. Do you have any thoughts or suggestions for people who should Put explore? Put it out there. Put it out there. We need foundation. And if you can be the foundation, celebrate that. Yeah. Definitely celebrate that. Yeah. I was going to say because there are a lot there are a lot of I think about Cassandra Wilson also mm -hmm. how much she has developed that range but we just don't hear it enough in in regardless of, of genre and I guess that brings me back to that as well the I was blessed to see your farewell tour with Sweet Honey and the Rock mm -hmm. where you got on stage and played violin <laughs> which I didn't know that you did <laughs> and it was a wonderful piece with the sound of rain in the background mm -hmm. and I couldn't help but thinking it would be a great, you know, even even with your statement about hip hop, I would have loved to hear you singing and playing that piece and Black Thought from the Roots doing a rhyme with that. Mm -hmm. Because that that's what I kept feeling in my spirit and hearing in my head right. as you delivered that piece. But will we see more of you playing violin and vocalizing? So. I don't think so. Um, physically, I'm not able to play. 
I had, um, this is like a fourth year of dealing with cancer, breast cancer, and I have what's called neuropathy in my hands, mm -hmm. and so playing is like really difficult, so that's not going to happen. Okay. Um, but I encourage people and young people who are playing violin to understand that there are lots of ways you can play violin. Yes. And in fact, even during the period of slavery, we played violin, they called it fiddle. Yes. Because we were more rhythmic and we used, we created our own instruments a lot of the time so they didn't look quite like the Eurocentric European instruments, but it was still with a bow, you know, and still fingering. And so we have that in our tradition. And I encourage young people to, to move to it, you know. And there are some violinists out there who are mm -hmm. pumped up. <laughs> they are pumped up, and I'm really glad to see it. Really yes. glad to see it. So. And, and finally, I know that you have, uh, have other obligations. Uh, we have been having a very extended conversation on the station and through our live events about multi-generational dialogue. Mm -hmm. And I know that, you know, we began this conversation with you saying we've lost a little something that we need to make sure younger people get. What are your thoughts about how we can look to music to help bridge some of those gaps and bring people back together again? Wow, I, I think um, once we understand the continuum, you know, um, young people are constantly creating new music, but we've always been creating new music. And it's based on something that came before. And really, that's what they need to understand, that you are not out there isolated. You have a, an ocean um, that preceded you, and you are putting drops into that ocean. You are not making the ocean. And so if we can have that kind of a conversation, I think it really, really makes sense. You know, we can look at the, the kinds of musical things that young people are doing and say, you know, that's really cool. Let me play this for you, okay? So that they can really hear the relationship that's what they need to understand, the relationship, what came before, what they have done to it, and you know what they continue to do with it is fine. Just understand the connections. Yeah. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs>